Welcome to another episode of the Three Pillars Academy digital series. I'm Sam Schwartz. I'm the director of content and video at the America East Conference, and I am pleased to have a conversation today with Brandon Costa, the director of digital at Sports Video Group. I'm excited to talk about some trends in the digital space. We'll touch on uh, broadcast productions as well, and Brandon is, is a bit of an expert uh, you could say in that space, and um, pleased to to welcome Brandon into this episode of the Three Pillars Academy. Hey Sam, thanks a lot for having me. Really appreciate it. everything going well. Everything is swimmingly since I last saw you as a, at a SVG um, down in New York City. I love the the conferences and summits that you guys put on, and and hopefully I'll get some insight from you uh, about that here today. But first, let, let's just start why um, by telling the group here. Uh, how you got your start at SVG and sort of what resources uh, SVG provides. Yeah, I, I mean, I graduated from Hofstra University on Long Island, a former America East school. Uh, I uh, started working in MLB Advanced Media right out of college, uh, did some newspaper work as well. And then the opportunity with Sports Video Group came up. Uh, it was something I'd never really heard of before. Uh, I never really considered working for a trade association, which is what I guess we would consider ourselves to be. Uh, we do have an editorial arm. Um, we're an editorial resource for people who work in the sports video production industry, be it at the collegiate level or for major networks, leagues, teams, whatever it may be. Um, and then we also have, um, you know, various events that we host throughout the year. Uh, we've got events that are hyper-focused on specific communities. Uh, I mean, you guys have been out to the SVG College Summit before, um, and we've also got summits on specific uh, technology um, uh, uh, segments of the industry, if you will, things like uh, everything as exciting as in video, in venue video board production to has as mind numbing as it sounds, transmission, storage, all that kind of stuff. Things that are very, very important to the bottom line. We kind of every once in a while, you're the medicine, we're the medicine you have to take. Uh, uh, but we do a lot of events throughout the year at some very exciting things. It's a cool company. I mean, we really serve as kind of the eyes and ears for the industry. Because uh, you know this, I mean, you you work so hard on your productions throughout the year that, that very rarely, if at all, do you get the chance to go see how other people are doing things. You might see the finished product, but what's in their control room? What's in their production truck? Where are they placing their cameras? All those things. So we get the opportunity, which we're very blessed to have the opportunity to go to numerous college football championships, Final Fours, Super Bowls, World Cups, Olympics, um, and major trade shows. Um, and then our events are designed to kind of bring those people together as often as they can to kind of share some of those ideas that we talk about. Um, so it's really the two pillars of the website, the newsletter, the social media accounts, uh, combined with the actual like uh, brick and mortar, come and shake hands and see people kind of physical events uh, that kind of make us who we are. And, you know, we're completely supported financially by our sponsors who are all the uh, the technology providers that many of the many of your listeners and many of the people who work at America East schools know everyone from the Sony's the Canon's the new techs um, the Ross videos all those down the line to some of the new startups that are trying to uh, break into the sports video industry so they financially support the organization get the opportunity to meet with people like yourself who are creating content on a daily basis uh, and that's kind of the the, the maniacal thing that we've kind of created over the last 12 or 13 years. <laughs> it's been great. I mean, I've enjoyed it myself. Uh, Aaron Iwaskiewicz and, and several others from our staff has, have certainly enjoyed, uh, again, the, the meet and greet that you talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, some of the things that you talk about are trends in the industry. So why don't we start um, just broadly, in, and I want to get your opinion on sort of what trends you've seen uh, in the digital space, in your world, uh, this world of, of digital and content that we're in. Um, over the past, say, six months to a year. Yeah, as an organization as a whole, just really quickly, some of the big ones that obviously SVG is tracking, that's everything from you know 4K, 8K, uh, augmented reality in both graphics and on, you know, in a mobile environment. Um, the overall transition to facilities being entirely an IP uh, after the passing of the SMPTE 2110 standard has kind of started to push that a little bit forward and people are starting to take that leap. Um, at home production is a huge one um, and obviously that rings true with a lot of people who work in the college environment um, it, It's funny hearing a lot of the uh, the networks talk about you know producing event from a centralized control room uh, You know in Charlotte or in Bristol or in uh, LA or in San Francisco or whatever it may be really the centralized control room has been a feature of a college campus 
uh, for quite some time on a school on campuses where they're fortunate enough to have it. Uh, and we've been doing the college summit uh, of ours for, you know, 10 years now. And that was the talk even back then, in addition to just learning how to use a camera, it was, okay, do we have a fly pack so we can pop anywhere? Do we have a little mobile truck so that we can drive it around campus? Uh, do we have the resources and are the facilities positioned in a way where we can build one control room in the basketball arena or the football stadium or the athletics office, wherever it may be, and then have that connected via fiber to all the venues where we have to produce video board shows or we want to live stream those events. Um, so that's a lot of what we've been seeing, uh, specifically on the digital side, there's things like the rise of 5G. Get used to it, you're gonna hear about it, it's gonna be bludgeoned into your head for the next five to 10 years, even though it's gonna take a while for it to become uh, mainstream. Any trade show you go to, uh, just take, if you take a shot, you can't even make it a shot game, if you take a shot every time you hear it, you'll be dead. Uh, um, but in specifically when it comes to this audience, it's about just how, it's, about, it's always about doing more with less, right? Whether that's with people or technology. Um, so, it, you know, it's really intriguing to, while we get to see what they're doing on grand scales at events like Super Bowls or Olympics or college football championships, whatever it may be, it's really what I love about working in the college space is that I find it incredibly talented uh, individuals are producing literally hundreds of sporting events a year with a, a you know a budget that's pennies compared to what some of those big productions are doing. Um, so a lot of the schools that work with you and even some of the work that you guys do, uh, you know, Sam is really admirable because it's you guys really are doing a lot with sometimes a very little resources, whether that's in manpower or in technology. Uh, so really, it, when it comes to the college market, it's whether it's automated production, robotic cameras, anything that you can do uh, utilizing students to help you in production, any other things that you can do that can help fill in the scale uh, while not sacrificing the quality uh, is kind of one of the big focus points that we kind of have right now and how technology can help support that. This all started with our group and our institutions. Uh, the staffs that you mentioned is actually AmericEast.tv, which mm -hmm. is the second year of OTT capability. And our fans really have enjoyed broadcasts uh, on ESPN from that standpoint as well, the OTT space. Uh, right. So how has that uh, space, the OTT streaming space, grown uh, in your eyes, Brandon? I think the biggest thing is that user behavior has matured, right? So, uh, you know, it wasn't that long ago where you, you, my, my mom or my dad was trying to watch March Madness Live and they're calling me on the phone, it's trying to figure out how the heck do they get this thing to work. I don't know my cable login. I don't know how to authenticate. What the heck does authenticate even mean? Uh, and now through things like Watch ESPN and March Madness Live and really outside of sports, things like Hulu, Netflix, HBO, uh, over the past five years or so have really helped kind of craft that behavior. Not to say that everyone's a whiz with their Roku device, but m many more people are better with it. And they're becoming accustomed to not just turning on their TV and channel surfing, they're becoming accustomed to turning on their TV and then turning on their Apple TV or their kids PS4 or their Roku and then accessing content that way. And uh, that's really advantageous for an organization like yours because if you can get your America East app into that environment where it's sitting in the same kind of queue as a person's Netflix account is and a person's Hulu account is, then that friction to entry is greatly reduced uh, and people are gonna be more likely to just kind of access your content. Um, one of the things that's interesting that's kind of happening, and this is less technology-based and more business-focused, uh, is that I'm sure you're starting to feel this already, um, and maybe it doesn't necessarily apply to you because I don't believe you guys charge a subscription fee to watch the content, right? Nope. No, okay. So we are getting that, we are getting to that point already where we might be asking people to subscribe to too many things <laughs> in order to watch their content. I mean, I'm an out-of-market sports fan right now, so yeah, I'm spending a lot of money on sports right now. I've got MLB.tv, I've got NHL.tv, we've got ESPN, we've got, you know, and then that's not, and throw that on top of your Hulus, your Netflixes, your HBOs and all that. And we're probably already paying more than the traditional cable bill probably was. Uh, so there's going to come a breaking point where there are just so many subscription services. And right now we're still, it still feels like we're kind of on that climb and we haven't hit that ceiling yet, but it really feels like it's coming soon. Um, so that direct to consumer subscription model offers some very intriguing opportunities to take your most engaged fans and really service them and have a relationship with them. 
Uh, but I think it will be important for many people to keep an eye on just how crowded this space can be and just how many entertainment dollars and, and, and entertainment minutes that people have to spend. Typically with America East production teams, uh, it's almost exclusively a non-linear capacity mm -hmm. that they're producing games for. So what in your eyes are, are the advantages and disadvantages uh, to producing in that space? I don't see too many disadvantages. Really the only disadvantage that I would see in a gut instinct is that is exposure. Uh, you'll obviously get a lot out of having the America East title game on ESPN. There's cross promotion. Um, there's people falling on it just kind of randomly. Uh, there's the odds of it being up on a TV in a bar and people watching it. And that accessibility is is tangible and I think it's still very valuable in this space because in a digital environment where there's just so many games available it could be hard for you to stand out uh, but if you are happy and content with your audience and you feel you have an avenue to communicate with your schools alumni prospective students uh, current uh, faculty, staff, and students, um, then it's a really, really great place to be because it's, uh, a, you know, mid-major conferences like the America East, and I could speak to this as, you know, a Hofstra basketball fan right now. Uh, my wife is an Iowa fan, so she's, she knows every game is accounted for on ESPN, Big Ten Network. Finding games is really usually not a problem for her. For someone who watches Hofstra basketball like me or, you know, New Hampshire basketball in the America East, Having the ability to watch the game, period, is a value, is a tremendous value. Um, so that is where that, uh, the advantage in that uh, lies from a business and a programming standpoint. Now, to your deeper question as far as production is concerned, um, I think it's kind of twofold. On one hand, it gives you the opportunity to experiment, try new things, um, and maybe produce games in a way uh, that can give fans uh, deeper access to your program specifically. Uh, on, on the second front, it also kind of creates this long tail where now every program wants every one of their matches create uh, matches produced, and that's how we end up with programs, you know, one and two person teams producing 100, 200, 300 sporting events in a calendar year. Uh, that is tough, and, and I know it's easy for me to say because I don't have. Uh, you know, I don't have a, you know, a field hockey or a soccer or a basketball coach stared me at the face saying we need this for my program. Uh, but I think we uh, there is a point where you have to uh, where the number while impressive can begin to impact the quality of the production. Uh, because we've all been on a campus where it's literally we're just trying to check boxes. Let's just get through. We got three events on Wednesday. Get them done. We got two on Thursday. Get them done. We got a football game on on Saturday. We got to prepare for, uh, especially at this time of the year when you got crossover season. You're not even into conference basketball tournaments yet. And you're like, wait a minute, baseball and softball are playing already? What's going on? <laughs> so it, it can be very easy to just get caught in the hamster wheel of just simply documenting the game when digital media and streaming services give you the opportunity to maybe do contemplate doing uh, lesser scale and greater quality, whether that means putting more cameras on a production or all offering alternate views of a production. Uh, I just think there's a lot more opportunity for the college space to begin to mature uh, in the uh, graduating from the simply documenting of games to the actual hardcore storytelling of a program within a live environment. There's a lot of great storytelling that gets done in features, uh, you know, hype videos, promos, stuff that finds its way onto social. Uh, I, I think there are ways that individual athletes, individual coaches, the program, the in-venue experience, uh, those things could be portrayed uh, better, I think, in a live event environment, uh, as opposed to simply just relaying X number of rebounds. Not time of possession, goals, passes, uh, you know, that stuff, while uh, certainly obviously entertaining and critical and kind of the baseline uh, for a production, I think there's room to continue to use technology and creative storytelling from some of the talent that you have uh, at your various schools uh, to kind of take that storytelling to a next level in the live sports environment. Kind of tying into your last point, how would you encourage video departments on campuses that maybe have a little less resources like we're talking about um, to fuel creativity in that way. 
Right, right. Well, I, I think one of the fortunate things is 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 that technology, and, and we're victim of this because we're kind of perceived to be a technology organization, and, and uh, that's a bit of a misconception because while we're supported by technology vendors, uh, you know, tech. If you are looking for technology to solve your problems, you have a bigger problem. Uh, technology has really got to be something that comes in the end that supports a, a better idea that you have. So simply like. If I were to just hand you, uh, you know, a 4K camera for free, you'd be like, all right, sweet, thanks. Uh, but unless you have someone who knows how to operate it, has some ideas for what kind of content they want to shoot with it, that's just going to be a really expensive metal box collecting dust on your desk. So technology is great, but nothing gets done without ideas and smart talent who can actually go out and execute new ideas. Um, so that being said, there's a lot of tools now. I mean, technology is more user friendly and cost effective as it's ever been. Uh, there, it, not not to say that it's cheap. I'm not minimizing how expensive you know some of this equipment can be uh, to put on a live event. Uh, but there are uh, there are opportunities out there now where you can use um, uh, where you can use cellular bonded connectivity. Or, or you can use just simply sell, you know, use your iPhone in unique ways to position different points. I mean, one of the cool things that we saw um, ESPN do this year, it wasn't at the college football championship, um, but they had uh, someone with a, they had a, they gave a fan a phone uh, in the stands at, I think it was a Duke UNC game or something like that. And they just kind of showed in a live environment what it was like to be in the stands. Uh, you have very cool environments and chances are I, I, this is speaking from an alumni perspective but this can be true of uh you know recruits as well uh one of the things that if i'm watching a Hofstra basketball game it's because i have an emotional attachment to that university because i went there and i want to see how they're doing and if the student section at Hofstra is big and it's rocking and it's jumping uh, that's gonna make me feel good it's make me think about my days in college and it's gonna make me want to be there so put me there. Uh, you could do that with something simple like a, like a live view or a TV view or a Comrex kind of like cellular bonded device. And again, this is just kind of one example. Uh, I think it's just important to use technology in a way that will serve your specific audience and your specific goals. What do we want to accomplish? So if we want to add a new layer of storytelling to our live event production, Maybe you want to say that it's, hey, we've got an incredible star athlete and we want to do something to spotlight him. We have a basketball team, our women's basketball team, uh, you know, just cracked the top 25 for the first time. And we have a player who's on the, the watch list for national player of the year. Our school has never had one of those before. Do an ISO cam on her. Follow her throughout the production. Um, if you're storytelling that you want to relay, and these could be conversations with your marketing department as well, is that, hey, we want people to realize how freaking awesome it is to go to an X basketball game or an X soccer game. Maybe you've organically created a really fun fan environment, and that's where maybe that becomes the focus of the broadcast. Maybe you put a camera in the, in the student section and make that a focal point uh, of the broadcast. Uh, again, it more comes down to the creativity of ideas and leaning into what makes your program, your teams special whether that's the coach, whether that's the player, whether that's the fans, whether that's what you're doing in the community. If you lean into what makes you special, and I can't give a generic answer for what that is because only you know what's special about your campus. Um, if you lean into that and then find ways that technology can help support that, then you're on a better road than saying, man, if we just had a 4K camera, that would change everything. As we talk about you know, communications departments and staffs on campus, uh, many of whom are, are similar to uh, the ones doing these broadcasts and producing and directing and, and all that. Um, they obviously have an incredible access to the teams mm -hmm. and the student athletes. Uh, so how would you kind of encourage them or suggest uh, that they leverage that access to coaches, student athletes, and get uh, the most out of that storytelling that you're talking about? It all comes down to, and this, uh, we sound like a broken record when you go to all the SVG conferences, specifically the college ones, um, but it's always bears repeating, is that this, this business is a relationship business. You are, if you are working for a university or an athletic department, many of us, if we're storytellers, maybe we come from a journalistic background like I did, and you might want to go in there and feel like I need to have like a you know, certain level of journalistic integrity and yada, yada, yada. Uh, but you work for your university or your conference office, whatever it may be. Um, 
you need to build relationships with those coaches because at the end of the day, they hold the keys to everything. Um, if they like what you do and they support what you do, you will get more access. And there is no shortcut to building relationships. You can't just walk in with a camera and say, oh, well, the last, in, with the last coach, we had access to every team meeting. You, you can't do that. That's going to be the easy path to not getting any more access again for quite some time. Now, fortunately, as uh, over the last five, 10 years or so, many, many more coaches, to their credit, have gotten it that video and all access kind of programming um, is good for their program. And they understand that you work for the athletic department. You're on their side. You're not here from ESPN or HBO Real Sports where you're trying to do some groundbreaking expose on how this coach is over practicing his team or whatever. It's like, look, you're here to show how cool it is to be a player in this program, how interesting this coach is, how interesting these players are, where they came from, why they chose to come to your school. Um, using that access and never taking that access for granted, uh, I think is really important, but it all comes down to building relationships and you really kind of almost have to play a diplomat role. You're like, uh, you are playing politics all the time, meeting coaches, talking to them. And there are times as hard as it is. And we deal with this too, with many of our members who we write about. I can't tell you how many times I've gone into a truck and saw them doing something really cool on a production and they turned to me and said, sorry, we're not ready to like talk about this on the record yet. Just don't let this out. And you yeah, just have to kind of bite the bullet and just do it. So uh, some of the best relationships decisions I've ever made usually have come from not running something when someone has asked me not to. As much as badly as you get a great shot or a great quote from someone, if a coach says to you like, hey, I'd rather not have that go out. Just listen to them, all right? And sometimes saying no will help you um, get that access later on because you've built that trust within them. Trust is very hard to build up and it's very easy to lose, so never lose sight of that. And entrust that in whoever you work with, your coworkers, and especially your students because students should not, expected, should not be expected to know how to play by those rules. It's on you to kind of create that culture of respect and communicating with your coaching staff and having you know showing them finished products to say like hey this is what all of that was for look how cool it turned out it's got x number of views making it feel a part of the process um, so there's so many things that you can and almost have to do along the way uh, to maintain that trust we can't all be blessed with some you know flashy like PJ Fleck, Gophers head coach type, who just loves the camera and is ready to go and is going to give you a million quotes. You know, not all of us are going to be blessed with someone like that. Uh, but you know, doing the right job and building those relationships and showing your work as you go uh, will help a any coach kind of trust you to have more access within the program. Put you back on campus for a second, Brandon, and, and mm -hmm. pretend that you're you know a leader in this space giving some direction to say students or, or whatever staff it may be to try to follow a team and, and get great content out where, you know, folks can follow along on Twitter and, and Instagram and, and what, what have you. But um, what I guess would emphasis would you put on, you know, the, the ability to capture that content and, and put it right on your phone and send it out? What, what kind of emphasis would you put uh, on that? I mean, it's, it's terrifying because you almost feel like you always have to be shooting at all times because the second you put your phone down, something cool is going to happen in the tunnel right before the team runs out to go play in the NCAA tournament for the first time or whatever it may be. Um, so yeah, shoot as much as possible. Always carry a backup battery pack with you <laughs> would be like one of my like de facto things. If you're, you, there's no excuse if your phone went dead. We can't be having that. Um, but for the most part, I think what it comes down to is you will have to use student help in this environment. And not only will you have to in order to meet the scale, I almost feel like as university athletic departments, and this is just my personal opinion, um, I think we have a moral obligation to do so. This is still a learning environment for everyone, for the players, uh, for students that are you know, a GA in your program, or whatever it may be. If you have students working for you and you will uh, in this environment um, they are your responsibility they reflect on you and you are responsible for teaching them and you are responsible if they 
uh, overstep lines or uh, don't shoot uh, don't shoot exactly what you're hoping to shoot for. Um, really, it's just having a lot of patience and uh, a lot of time to really sit down. And I know time is something that we don't have a whole heck of a lot of right now. Um, but taking the time to sit down with those students, um, going over their work with them, um, you're going to probably recruit, you know, 50 to 100 kids and maybe two or three of them are going to be really, really good. Um, hang on to them for dear life. Uh, do whatever you can um, to make them feel like their work is valued um, and instill in them all the things that you would instill in any other coworker that you're working with that's a full time staff. They work for the university. They represent the university um, and their work matters, you know, regardless of school size or whatever it may be. Uh, so I think putting a lot of time focusing on your students is valuable because I know it can be easy to say, oh, you know, I get a good kid and then he's gone in two years uh, or she has gone in a year and a half or whatever it may be. Uh, some of the best programs that are out there right now, be it, uh, you know, the Ball States of the world or TCU, and there are numerous others. Uh, I could do a laundry list. I'd have you here all day if I could list these. Um, They've built cultures where the students uh, not only are talented, but they care about the product. They feel and they have a part of the product and they almost kind of self-police themselves. I mean, when I was in college, I worked at, for the student radio station and we covered live events all the time. And we very rarely had a professional on, you know, in the room with us. Students can do amazing things if you put them in the position to succeed. So don't be afraid of them. But understand that you know at the end of the day you ultimately will be responsible for them but i think if you empower them more often than not they will surprise you and not disappoint you good insight brandon really appreciate it and i'll, I'll let you uh get an svg plug in here um, all right before we let you go what uh what events does svg have coming down the line i know i'll, I'll probably be at the college summit in may with aaron Good, good. Looking forward to seeing you guys. Yeah, Erin is actually a member of our advisory committee now for that. So we really appreciate her uh, giving her some of her time and expertise on that. But yeah, you're talking about the SVG College Summit, which happens every year in Atlanta. This year it is May 29th, 30th and 31st. Uh, we got some really cool stuff lined up, including the possibility to go on a tour of uh, Georgia Tech's new ACC network approved facility, get to see their control rooms, rack room, uh, all that kinds of really geeky video stuff that we all love. Uh, John Wildhack, who's the director of athletics at Syracuse, uh, is keynoting the event. Um, so if you work in a university athletic department uh, or a conference office uh, like you, Sam, uh, and you're creating content on a regular basis, live, on demand, whatever it may be, uh, I, I mean, this is a fantastic conference that really is a great idea sharing and handshaking opportunity to just kind of meet other people. I know that for a lot of people who work at schools, you, you know, who are like America East schools, these are obviously pretty slim staffs. We're talking one, maybe two people kind of operations. Sometimes it's amazing just seeing them looking around going, oh my God, finally someone else who has the same problems that I have. Because you can feel very alone in your little video world, uh, you know, on a mid-major athletic department as the only one who seems to care about any of this stuff. <laughs> but you come to our show and it's, you're just surrounded by people who have all kinds of ideas, who are battling a lot of the same pain points as you. Uh, so it's a really valuable opportunity if you can get there. Like every SVG event, if you work in the industry, it is free to attend. Uh, we do not charge a registration fee. Uh, you can get, just get yourself there and we'll be more than happy to have you. Uh, you can go to the website svgcollege.com. Uh, and you can also follow Jenny, follow anything uh, at sportsvideo.org. There's all kinds of other various events that SVG does throughout the year. You are not, as a college, only allowed to go to the college event. Come to all of them if you want. Uh, sportsvideo.org slash events has those. Also, if anyone's uh, fortunate enough to go to the NAB show, we're having a party, but, which is way more fun than just sitting and listening to panels all day. So if you want to come and hang out at the uh, Omnia nightclub at Caesars and get a really cool view of the strip and drinks on us, uh, that's on Sunday, April 7th. So you can also sign up for that on the site as well. So uh, yeah, that's, uh, I mean, we got a bunch going on. If I, I, so it's probably best for them to just check out the site and see if anything uh, uh, hits in their wheelhouse for them. Sounds good. Well, it's been a great uh, chat with you, Brandon. I look forward to seeing you in Atlanta in May. And uh, again, for all of our viewers out there, if you want more of this, you can certainly follow Brandon on Twitter. But uh, with that, Brandon, thanks for joining this episode of the Three Pillars Academy Digital Series. Really appreciate it. You guys do a fantastic job. Love this series. Really practical, useful content. Uh, 